How's it going? So um, I suppose if you're going to be interested, then you've probably had an application that you didn't quite understand before. So if you've understood every app that you've ever seen, then you, you can just go for a coffee break, I think. Um, so this, this talk is observability um, three ways. I'm using the term observability. That's what we used in uh, Twitter back when I worked there. Um, but some people call it telemetry or, or monitoring. Um, but uh, one of the things that's been quite common, I've noticed, especially working in distributed tracing, is that people have um, existing tools. They, they have their log analysis and roll-ups, and they have their metrics. And they may or may not have tracing. They may have an APM system with, with uh, you know, dashboards and things. And it's sometimes hard to tell where something starts and when something stops. And um, so that's one of the things I'm going to try to take on and let me know how it goes. So the good news is that there's a unifying theory between these things. Um, uh, Coda Hill mentioned this to me, which is that everything ends up being based on events. And so if we think of like the atoms of observability, the, the, these are the events. They, they don't break down much um, uh, below that. And in the most simplest case, uh, logging, we can think of as just putting events on a timeline. And they may have structure, they may not have structure, but you know, that's, that's the simplest uh, measuring we can do and recording we can do. Um, metrics, on the other hand, are themselves events that are derived from these things, summarizing usually. So uh, you might take um, you know, 10 events of request latency and then um, bucket them, and then that bucket is now a new type of event. Um, and that can continue, uh, for example, if you change granularity of time um, to get like requests per minute instead of requests per second or something like that. And tracing is, is also events, but it has a really interesting um, nuance to it, which is that you can tell that happens before a relationship. So for example, you can tell that this request, in fact, calls this next request, uh, independent of just timing. So for example, if your clocks are all a mess, uh, you would still know that you know, this customer request ended up causing this backend request. So at the end of the day, they, they're all um, they're all giving us insight based on events or, or nuance. And um, where they focus is, is a good place to kind of tease apart um, one from the other. So like logging, um, many times when we're developing ad hoc, uh, we may find that you know, some crappy error happened. And so that might just be dumped right out to a log. Either we did it or the system did it because we didn't trap it. But at any rate, um, exceptions tend to end up in logs. And the, uh, if, you, if you roll around, like um, you know, exceptions are something that are also usually kept in, in traces, or at least that there was an exception. Um, but it can tell you more about that. For example, the impact. So if you do have a happens before relationship, meaning this led to this, and this error happened, well, what, what was before it? Was that a customer request? Was that a redundant request? Um, you can tell a lot more about the impact of that specific thing in the system. And if we keep going around the circle here, well, tracing has a, a, often has a focus on latency because we know latency is really important to us. If something takes too long, we often give up. Uh, we're very impatient. And so we want to tell um, about uh, latency, not just from one request, but how our whole apps are doing. So we'd, we'd like to know, in, in aggregate terms, like what's, what's our latency? And uh, for a cluster or for a node, and, and metrics tend to be um, really good at focusing on, on the aggregate nature of, of these events. Um, but if you keep spinning around, you'll, you can even find that your metrics include um, you know, the amount of error counts over time uh, and things. And so it's, it's, it's neat that they have these focus areas, the, the places where they all overlap. You know, one of the things that they, they all intersect at is, is request-based information. So if you think about um, logs, usually you would, if you have a HTTP request coming into your system, it might have a side effect in a log file. It might have incremented a counter and metrics, and it might have also been in a trace. So right in the middle, you have a place where all these three tools give you this information about a, you know, a similar, uh, in this case, maybe an endpoint. But on the other hand, there are things w which they don't really overlap. So for example, in logging, uh, you'll have things that are non-request 
scoped in nature. So for example, if you're running a garbage collected system, you might have garbage collection events or you might have audit events which aren't necessarily going to end up in a trace. Um, and in metrics, we may have things that are not system in nature. So for example, like counts or any of our value metrics about our application performance. If you're at Netflix, then you might you know, want to know what your uh, streams started per second uh, of, of video streams, which is you know, maybe related to some of these other things, but it actually is, a, is something that, that uh, you would use metrics for that aren't necessarily system in nature. And you know, within within traces, like there's there's definitely good overlap between logging and metrics, but that that uh, causality information isn't usually also kept in the other the other two buckets. So so they have focus, they have interlaps, uh, uh, I mean uh, overlaps, but they they also do have some some unique things to add, and and so that's one of the reasons why. Um, hoping this talk helps with folks because we often have like one or two, or maybe we're considering. Uh, adding something else, and what do you get with that? What, what does it buy me? Because all of these decisions cost something, so let's understand what, we're, what, what our values are. So to drill down a bit more, um, I like to try to make it a bit practical. So if we use that latency, the thing that's in the center of all of those, then we can talk about these three tools, which are not the universe of all tools, but these three that I have time to talk about today in, in common common uh, terms. So let's take response time. Um, in a log, you know, you'd, you'd end up with response time as in, in a log line or the difference between two of them. Um, metrics are obviously very good at, at um, storing numbers and response time can be represented as one. And uh, of trace, um, we'll, we'll get into that, but essentially they, they often have a focus, a central fact, which is uh, latency. Um, a lot of these things where you see some things dumped is just because I'm trying to make it a bit more practical. Um, so for example, this, this might be an uh, ACP logging format some people have seen before. And the neat thing about this format is, you know, it cramps a lot of information in, in a line, which is good. Um, but also it adds latency as a, as a trailing field, which is nice because usually if you're trying to do like like napkin latency, you'd have to like compare numbers between two different lines. And this particular format happens to place the request latency as the last field. So you might be able to get an accurate number um, for how long something t took, which is not necessarily going to be messed up by clocks, clock adjustments from NTP or something. So in this case, we're looking at, at something which dumped out um, you know, a, a microsecond because microservices. And uh, that, that turns out into 95 milliseconds, which who knows? Like we, we know that's the time. But if you've worked with developers before, you notice that when somebody says something is slow, they mean all sorts of things. It could mean it's 30 seconds. It could mean it's 30 milliseconds or whatever. It's, it's very um, ambiguous until you keep asking questions again and again. Metrics is one of those things that can help us take facts like, a latency figure and then answer, well, is it actually slow or like what is that number? What, what's the relevance within the population of my system? Because our, our systems have slow times because we're under a crunch. Uh, maybe if we're running in uh, Twitter itself, then you know during Super Bowl, there's going to be a lot of activity. It's going to be hitting things and the system is going to behave differently during that time, even if it behaves well. And so metrics, if we take you know, a fact, for example, uh, at you know, 2.19 p.m., this 95 milliseconds, well, A, was that a slow request? Well, maybe if it was very slow, alarm would have gone off. But we could still see within the population at the time you know, how are requests doing. And this is obviously not a real app, but though I would love to see an ASCII art monitoring app. Um, but in this case, the system was, was particularly troubled uh, you know, prior to this. But at the time that this request happens, it, it was a bit slower than other requests, and not because the system in general was slow. And so that's useful information when we're trying to understand requests in our system. If we look at traces, they, they really kind of drill down on a single request. They can help us uh, triage and troubleshoot customer issues directly. Um, so we, instead of saying like, well, you know, okay, generally speaking, the system was okay. 
but that doesn't answer the, qu the, the customer who may be having some you know, tail latency which is not you know, represented in, in our um, 95th or whatever. And so in this case, we can look at individual requests if we're lucky enough to have a trace and, and understand why was it slow. Um, and this is good because when we're doing troubleshooting, we need to be able to triage and rule out um, you know, areas that, that we don't need to explore because time is important. We want to resolve failures quickly. And so if we happen to have a trace like this and yellow meant a failed request, then we would know that the, the overall customer request was successful. It didn't actually break the upstream because the top bar isn't yellow, but it was delayed. Um, if it didn't have a failed network request, it would have been faster than normal and it would have been perfectly fine. And so we have a choice to make. Do we, is that a good enough answer? Or you know, is whoever's on the other side of the phone, are they going to be okay with that? If so, you're done. You don't have to do anything else. You just know that it was a network calls delay. And you don't even have to blame the database team. I mean, so it's really nice to have a trace because you can get a good idea of what, what was actually responsible for some delays. Um, so you'll have your own thoughts. If you don't, here's some you can take. Um, I, I kind of feel like logs are easiest. We tend to, to learn logging, like what is hello world except for our first log statement? And you know, these things are easy to grab, easy to understand. You'll, you'll be able to have a lingua franca, franca in any programming language that uh, somebody can understand what a log is. Um, metrics are neat because you know, they, they give us this ability to understand trends within our system. They add the relevance. Um, which, which helps us because everything is very subjective um, when we're working with, with systems. And, you know, traces can help us understand a specific request or even a combination of events, you know, with, with more sophisticated tooling. So, for example, uh, folks at Dynatrace showed me some neat tool where they could reconstruct a post-mortem from trace data to actually show the system dying and coming back together. And, and that, that sort of information is, is neat and can be built with trace data. So how do you write this code? And you know, we don't usually spend a lot of time uh, writing timing code, but we could, and some of us do. And at the end of the day, um, each of these tools would have different approaches to, to writing timing code because of how they store data and how they report it. So logs, generally speaking, are either delimited or formatted in some way, and so you cram latency data in there, um, or you rely on externally provided formats, such as like that there's going to be a timestamp field to the, to the left. Metrics um, are all about numbers and storing numbers, so um, we'll, we'll see examples of that. And um, tracing uh, is where we're, we're starting propagating this, this idea of this, this overarching request through the system. The jargon here is that it's often called a span, which represents a single operation within your overall request. Um, when I say overall request, I mean that, you know, usually, especially with microservices, we could have a front-end request going into the system. That system is usually not a monolith, so it's going to break down into multiple requests, and maybe it hits memcache, and maybe it hits a database and other things. And so each of those things would be a span, and the overall request is the trace. So logging, I took some code from OKHTTP, which is my favorite uh, Java library for HTTP communication. And you know, there's a, a, a logging interceptor. And so essentially, it's, it used, usually looks something like this. You have some stopwatch, and then you cram the latency someplace. And so it's, it's about formatting. And uh, the, the metrics, on the other hand, this is, this is Scala, if you haven't seen that language before. But um, this is a, uh, you know, usually you would take from a, uh, a stats or a metrics registry, you'll get something that's scoped to an endpoint or, or at least a, a type of data, like re request latency, and then you just add numbers to it. So for example, how you collect the number is different with, within, langu within languages and libraries, but again, it's usually a stopwatch type of activity, and, and you just sync it to this, this statistics gatherer thing. Um, tracing is a bit more complex because it has more state to it. It's, it's, 
out of the, the two I mentioned so far, this one's actually stateful. Um, because when I say that there's a overall request flowing through the system, guess what that means? There is state and it's moving. And so um, you have to actually make sure that when something goes in one side, it doesn't get lost before it goes out the other side. So this is code from uh, Lyft Envoy, uh, which is a C++ um, proxy, AKA mesh. And um, this, this is C++ and I've dumbed it down a bit, but essentially you create um, a span representing the operation and you make sure that it isn't lost by the time the finish callback happens. And that finish implies often enough stopping the, the timer. Uh, and then at that point, it can be sent out. When, when this uh, trace goes between systems and it's HTTP, usually you'll see like a trace ID header and a span ID header or something like that. And so that's how it manifests and that's how it gets from point A to point B. So the impact of this, I, you know, um, logs are, you know, ubiquitous, you know, like hello world, but we do require coordination because if we're going to write a format, we're assuming somebody can read it, whether it's a human or a system. So that should, that's a type of coordination. Either you're coordinating based on you know, human intuition or a format or something like that. Um, metrics, and in my opinion, are the easiest APIs to work with because you're just putting numbers into them. And it's hard to get that wrong. Um, you could put the wrong number in, but it's hard to put the number in incorrectly. Um, the uh, tracing is, is the hardest because it's doing the most work. Um, because it's, it's actually having to carry state through the system and make sure that that's coherent. Um, because otherwise, if it didn't, you could be looking at a trace which isn't actually what happened and that could confuse you and, and cause damage instead of helping you. The so next, next point we'll talk about is, okay, you know, we can, we can definitely do that type of stuff, should we? Um, should we, I think, is one of the less discussed questions in, in uh, you know, engineering. It's like, yes, we could, should we? Um, and the reason I say that is because usually uh, frameworks um, do, do a lot of this stuff for us. Um, we may write our, our stuff from scratch without frameworks, but, but often enough, if you look, they have capabilities um, that I've mentioned in, inside the box. And also, even though I've dumbed down the examples, there's lots of edge cases in, in uh, timing code. So for example, um, I hinted at like clock skew is a problem. So for example, the, the clock on one system may be different than the clock on the, the, the other system. And then if you pass data between them, how do you remedy that? The, even within the same box, the you know, clocks might uh, correct their time. And so for example, if it moves the clock backwards, it could look like your request took negative time to complete, which would be awesome, but not really very realistic. Um, there's all sorts of edge cases, which are fun, um, but not necessarily something that we all need to, need to know or work on, unless we're hobbyists. So how do you not see tracing code? There's a, there's a number of ways of doing that, and I'm, I'll try to break down a few. Um, one is like a buddy, which means you have some other process that's doing it for you. And so uh, it's intercepting your code or your process or your container. And, um, and uh, that, that's, that's gonna be um, you know, uh, taking responsibilities, like, um, which we're seeing more and more often in these like, uh, service mesh type of deployments. Uh, another way, which is quite popular and probably the most popular way for uh, performance management tools or, or agents, which will um, monkey patch or otherwise uh, change, change the code as your application boots up and like puts in um, you know, instrumentation points which will capture um, uh, you know, either latency or other types of information on your behalf. And then another way to not see code is to use frameworks which then can be configured uh, to, to intercept your code. So buddy tracing, this is actually uh, an image from Linkerd, who her, uh, one of the few options out there in the um, uh, service mesh space. And so it's, it's an example of where you have some sort of a sidecar that's responsible for your inter-service communication. So you, know, you might be sending your request to localhost and then it's actually doing uh, outbound requests on your behalf. And the neat thing about service meshes is that 
they can do th neat things, like for example, uh, Linkerd has the ability to give you like a special route. So if you wanted to um, uh, send a, a percentage of your of your uh, customers to a new feature, it could propagate a a special route to send them to your test cluster, and, uh, based on some you know policy data. So you know, propagation isn't just for like trace IDs, making sure trace IDs go from point A to point B, but it could be used for like deadline uh, guards to make sure that if a request took too long to finish, that it doesn't just keep proliferating load throughout the system uh, and, and other uh, metering, for example, if, if you're doing any metering information. So um, buddies usually do more than tracing actually, um, but one thing they do, do tend to do is, is um, you know, tracing. Agents are, are super powerful things. Um, this is an example of a uh, uh, Byte Buddy, which is a Java uh, agent library. And the way these things work is that they, as your application is booting up, it will literally change the code to, to for example, trace it or, or do other things. And if you look underneath of a lot of performance management tools, like that's how like the secret sauce of like App Dynamics or, or something would work, is that they're they're actually doing um, automatic uh, tracing for you. You wouldn't you would never need to see the code that's doing that, but of course with open source we can see some of it. And um, you know the interesting thing about agents is that like there are things that you can do in agents you just can't do with code normally. So in Java worlds, for example, you may have like thread pools and things, and you can't actually touch them. They're implicit objects, and um, agents can touch anything. So, so they're pretty powerful, and that's why a lot of performance tools use them. Frameworks, this is an example of, a, of like a ton of annotations representing how to trace something in Spring Boot. Uh, you don't have to use this. It add, adds a file to you know to your class path, and then magically it does this on your behalf. But uh, frameworks often know how best to trace one thing, and that's neat because it also invites the authors of the of the libraries to do that work, and so you get like a high a high chance of of it, it working out well. And um, so frameworks usually have a, a configuration approach, whether that's placing a jar or, or placing something into a plugins directory, um, but you have something, or, or like a big YAML or Hocom file, uh, you have something that's configuring um, the ability to, to, to trace stuff. And you know, they, they have their, their pros and cons, but like if you don't have any choices, usually you choose one that you have. Like, so if I don't have an agent, then I can't use an agent, so therefore I might use a framework. And if I have none of these options, then maybe I would end up in a, in a case where I have to write the code myself. All of them, at the end of the day, have to ship that data out of process. And this is a pretty interesting thing about observability and, and, and worthwhile mentioning, because uh, a lot of the cost of a system is like, you know, what, what ancillary uh, things are going on. I remember I was asking um, Netflix once about why, you know, why they don't do, you know, a lot of, of tracing. It was because, you know, the, it would end up being a more expensive system than actually running Netflix. And so we have to always be careful about things like how much data we collect, how long we retain it. And each of these tools have very different ways of, um, or, or, or basically different, different things to add to this discussion. Um, so logging, usually we have a, a pipeline, and that could be like you know, ELK or, or whatever your, fam your favorite um, way to get logs out from, from your apps into, into where they can be analyzed. And often it's, it's parsing in nature. Um, whereas metrics are summarized, and uh, oftentimes you'll get uh, you know, they're, they're summarized in the app itself, and then maybe that's converted to, to some request per second, but then your system might summarize it again to request per minute, and you know, as, it's, as it's going through the system, it might be uh, summarized, and that has a lot of, of gravity on, on not just the shipment, but retention of data, and, and, and how metrics are very different than logs, for example. The other thing is, is that metrics are, are often near real time, which is another, you know, if somebody says, like, if you have a problem with somebody being unspecific about the word latency, try the word near real time, because somebody might think it's a second, or they might think it's 30 seconds, or they might think it's uh, 200 microseconds. So again, all these things about time always ask 
clarification. What do you mean by that? Um, traces tend to have a similar latency, like uh, readback uh, interval, uh, and, uh, and are um, expected in most cases to be uh, available as soon as a request has happened. So when we look at the nitty gritty, if you've used um, uh, Logstash, you, you've probably seen something similar to this. We've been parsing logs so long that we actually have tools to help parse them, like Grok, which is a, a way to typify how we store things like IP addresses and numbers and such. And so you can, you can basically take these patterns, these coordinated things, like whether they're intentionally or unintentionally coordinated, and, and uh, you know, create things that we could possibly roll up later on. And of course, like I said in the, in the beginning, things are derived from events. You may actually have metrics that are produced from your log uh, output too. So that, that may be, in fact, uh, what you're doing here. Um, bucketing can be done many ways. Uh, we hear a lot of things in statistics. We hear things about percentiles and histograms and, and buckets and things. And this is an example of, of a way to classify requests that goes with my earlier diagram, which is like, okay, we have some boundaries. Maybe they're coordinated up front. They certainly are in this image. And um, so we know that anything below a millisecond is super fast and anything beyond 50 seconds is super slow. And then we just, as the data goes into the system, we just increment a number according to that classification. And that has a neat side effect because it dramatically reduces the amount of data that we're sending out a process. Why? Because shipping the number one isn't a heck of a lot different than shipping the number one million. Um, it's, it's 64 bits, uh, and, or 32 actually. Uh, depends on, on how, you, you, um, how you ship it. But, but at any rate, it's, it's not um, a direct line from the count of requests, and that, that's a powerful tool we can use. Uh, spans, on the other hand, we, you know, in order to build these, these graphs um, that, that show us what a request looked like, we do have to retain a lot more information. Um, the parent-child relationships, uh, at least the duration, and usually some lookup tags and things. So how does this impact like our data on disk and, or not on disk? It's, um, well, logs we know, it grows. That's the first thing we know about logs, is that they grow. Um, they fill up disks and things. And they grow with traffic, although they grow with other things, um, that, like errors that have nothing to do with traffic. Um, but they definitely grow with traffic. And they also grow with verbosity, because logging has a, a usual function, which is like a debug level or a trace level. And if some developer is trying to discover more with logging tools, usually they will turn on the verbosity uh, which then could end up, you know, adding more data in the system versus just local to that process. Metrics are neat because they're fixed size with regards to traffic. That's what I was talking about, how, like, shipping the number one isn't that much bigger than shipping the number a million. And so that means that you're actually, um, your, your data will grow based on the amount of things you're measuring, like your endpoints or how many types of, of data that you're, you're collecting per endpoint. But the traffic itself isn't a, isn't a primary function uh, you know, for, for size. And um, you know, there's definitely nuance around that. If you have a lot of um, uh, dimensions, like cus you know, customer dimensions, you can definitely get more metrics. But it's not anywhere near uh, as directly linked as uh, like logs and metrics would with, with regards to traffic. And this tells us how we can reduce this volume in our system. So if we're looking at logs, well, the first thing you'll, you'll have anybody uh, tell you is stop logging things um, because if you have irrelevant data going into the system, you're just adding weight to the system. That's why a lot of these tools at the collection ingress points have filters and other things because we know that oftentimes we have data that we can't even control being um, placed into logs. So how do we handle that? That's, that's a normal function of, of logging pipelines now. Um, metrics, uh, when I was in the observability team at Twitter, we had a uh, kind of read your rights initiative, which is that you know, it's very easy and interesting to put metrics for everything. But then you could end up with writing 1,000 more times information than you're ever going to read. 
and that just adds load and cost to your infrastructure. So if you're trying to look at things about you know, controlling volume of metrics, well, you can use things like a coarser granularity instead of like uh, aggregated on seconds, on, on minutes or, or something. But also, uh, and then you know, within like maybe the last five minutes has this, and then, but the last day has that. But also, just more simply, read your writes. So one thing that I tend to do in um, open source project work that, I, that I'm on is I tend to ask why when people add metrics, it's like, are you, are you anticipating someone to use this? Because um, in a lot of cases, you can actually um, uh, get by with, with what frameworks do, which, and, and, and frameworks often will give you the ability to, to mute metrics uh, a lot easier than you, if you were using custom code to do that. So um, tracing, uh, its primary way of reducing volume is sampling, um, which that means is that, say you have a, a, a hundred requests going through your system, maybe you choose to keep a trace for five of those. And so that would be probabilistic. So um, you'd, you'd wanna make sure that, um, you know, uh, your rate isn't so, so small. Um, so for example, if you have a, a front end like Twitter, you could get by, with a very low um, sample rate, like maybe even a, a, a thousandth of a percentage of requests. But if you have a um, less used endpoint, you might just take 100% of those because they're not gonna overload your system. So there's a little bit more choices to do. Um, if you do sampling with traces, you have to be consistent. So unlike logs, like logs sometimes are shipped over UDP transport, so you're gonna have some accidental sampling because packet loss. Um, and you might have even 10% uh, of your data that's just lost. And that, that could be okay depending on your use case. Traces, if you have lost data, it can actually be disruptful um, because you're using this to tell what actually happened in the system. So the sampling should be consistent and a lot of the tools, for example, the one I work on, Zipkin, is, is always like a decision up front and then that's carried through uh, to make sure that it's, all, it's either all or nothing. Uh, and then fi finally on this like volume thing is how long is data kept? Um, so logs and metrics, you know, we tend to see people with policies of like uh, 30 days or long or much longer uh, on logs. And um, traces are interesting. Um, uh, we had, uh, I think a three day policy at Twitter on trace data because it was primarily used for triage. So if you put them all in the same system, uh, having different retention policies per type of data can be helpful to you because there's some cases where for audit requirements you may have to keep certain log data a lot longer, but that doesn't apply to metrics and maybe it doesn't apply to your trace data. So you have a lot of tools. So if, you, if observability is in one big classification and everything there has to be stored for a year, then you're looking at a very expensive retention policy. So um, hopefully some of these things I mentioned about this, which of course I'll post slides you can look at later, um, can help you make good decisions based on your environment and you know, what, what advantages you can take from these um, and uh, decide what, what retention could be useful. And here we are. So we have these systems. We know a lot about them. Um, and I haven't even really mentioned too much about individual implementations, like you, know, you could be using commercial tools or Prometheus or Logstash or Kibana, whatever. Um, they do work together, like, and um, it's not just that they do similar things, um, but often if you have like um, uh, correlated tags or, or lockup keys or um, you know, uh, ways of, of um, classifying the data in the same way, indexes, then you can use them together. So you'll find that in tracing, usually people, if they're doing tracing, they also plop the trace ID into the logs. So that way you can correlate them together and you can find things like usually exceptions that you might not actually happen to have in your trace data. If you're looking at metrics, you may have an RPC name or an endpoint name, which is captured commonly between these two tools. And that way you can easily transition between um, metrics which might show something that's awry and either representative traces that are in that exact same time period or at least you can look them up somewhere else. And you know, because the granularity um, 
uh, yeah, as you get to wider and wider scopes, you have a higher and higher chance of, of, of a granularity match between the three systems. So like cluster, host, um, data center, things like that tend to be a type of, of tag that you could use and go across all of the types of sources. And so when you stitch these things together, they can, um, you can use them together uh, and you know, even if they're in different retention policies and things, and, um, and uh, you know, see, see uh, broader or, or um, constrained context of the same, same events. So, I mean, I've talked about a lot of things, but I think if we try to distill down what, what, I, what I hope uh, you could come away with, is that logging metrics and tracing are different tools that, that all participate in our help uh, and help us to understand what our apps are doing. And if we, if we know what these are, we can leverage their strengths and understand their weaknesses as opposed to like combat them against each other. And, and that's going to, to help us with the actual environments we have. Um, many of us still have monoliths. Logs are great there. Um, that doesn't mean they're bad for microserverliths. It just means that like, there, there are different uh, ways that, that uh, we can use um, each of these tools, and you wouldn't necessarily turn off one to turn on the other. And um, you know, through, through the ability of, of identifying patterns and exception cases and understanding individual requests in our systems, we have a lot of power to answer questions not limited to why this is slow, but actually what is it doing? Um, you know, in microservices, we don't, uh, you know, we're getting larger and larger architectures and we're giving a lot more flexibility to developers in some cases. We may not be able to read their code, um, but we could at least identify what it's, what's happening from a system level. And, you know, as requests ac go across the system, that gives us a lot of power uh, for triage, for getting people on the same page. And if you felt this was helpful, um, one thing I would encourage you to read is uh, Peter Bergeron's blog in general, but he also had a blog that inspired this talk, which, which uh, talks about uh, logging metrics and tracing. And um, uh, also the, a lot of folks that review this content um, uh, who, I, who I work with in, in, in tracing land, in, including Boz, who works on this, this thing called GoKit, um, Bogdan from, from Google, who's working on uh, Census, which is like the successor to Dapper. Uh, Jean Ritt from Critio, which is a, a, you know, a, pr a pretty high volume uh, service over there in Paris. Nick from uh, Nike, who, who, who has some uh, interesting open source libraries. Uh, and then uh, Coda Hale, who has, has as well. Felix, who uh, runs a, a small open source APM called Stage Monitor, and, and Abhishek from Amazon X-Ray. Um, but if you didn't like it, then please don't share that with us. <laughs> Just give it right here. And uh, then maybe the next talk will be even better. But um, thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm ready for them. So we have lots of questions, um, but we don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to try and just pick, uh, pick one or two. Um, so if this is a good one. Someone asked, when the tracing is hidden, um, i.e. it's not done explicitly in the code, how do you automatically verify or test that all the things are configured correctly, that the tracing is happening, all of that sort of stuff? Yeah, so if you don't trust your framework, then you, what you would do is you would treat it like other things that you don't trust, which mm -hmm. are black boxes. So, so you, for, you could, for example, uh, send, uh, you know, a, like a micro integration test, which would have a, a tracing endpoint, and then just verify uh, that you can read back the uh -huh. trace. I do that actually in, in in my apps to verify that. So one is look at the guys. Integration if test. you're leaving, can you not talk, please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So one thing Sorry. is is to like look at the tests that exist for the, whatever you're using. Yeah. But also, you can just in any suspectful system, you can always black box. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and there's another question about uh, W3 have added a proposed um, server timing spec. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Do you think it will have um, uh, any change in the way we monitor or report on performance? Um, so there's interestingly more, more spec works uh, going on now. And, and in, in fact, even, even in tracing, we, I, I've just gotten more information about like a trace spec uh, 
for headers and, and things like that. I think mm -hmm. one of the important things that I try to work on with groups is, is making sure that folks collaborate even if they don't share a single spec mm -hmm. because it's helpful to, to do that. And I think that um, there's been some unfortunate uh, cases where, for example, in, in your browser toolkits, there's a lot more uh, going on there and also at the kernel level, mm -hmm. like there's perf events and things like that. And I think over the next year or two, you'll find more links between uh, mm -hmm. these type of specs. And it's up to us to, to also ask folks if we see a tool that isn't using something we're interested in, whether it's a spec or otherwise, because mm -hmm. not everybody's aware of everything. Yeah. And then two uh, Zipkin specific questions. Is there a hosted managed SaaS version at all of this, um, or is it like new Relic plugins, things like that? So uh, two questions uh, there. Uh, <laughs> so um, Zipkin was originally inspired by a, a Google technology called Dapper, which is now called Census. Mm -hmm. And the hosted service of that is called Stackdriver. Uh, there's actually a proxy that you can send to Zipkin apps data to Stackdriver, uh, and it's actually a free service. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there's also others uh, that, that are accepting uh, Zipkin data, too. The, um, uh, if you have existing monitoring agents, um, I would say that it's, it's kind of a, more a work in progress for those to send to like a private Zipkin install. Okay. Uh, and in fact, I'm going next to, to Linz to talk with Dynatrace who are working on something like that so that their, their stuff can actually report in, into Zipkin systems. Okay. So just keep an eye out. Yeah. Cool. There's a few more questions, but Adrian will be on Slack afterwards to answer them, I'm sure. Let's yeah. give you a round of applause. Thank you. Okay, cheers.